All right, today we're going to be talking about Rococo art and architecture. Last week, we kind of finished up with that English Baroque architecture. Uh, we're looking now at the 1700s to sort of the early 1800s as we look at Rococo in that age of enlightenment. Uh, Rococo architecture emerged in France around 1700 and spread throughout Europe in the 18th century, characterized by lightness, grace, Playfulness and intimacy, Rococo's colorful and fragile decoration uh, concentrated on trivial subject and pastoral pastoral poetry and art. And so we're going to look at a real shift, uh, particularly uh, in how the artists use light and dark in their paintings. If you'll remember uh, that the the, Roco or the uh, Baroque art we looked at last week and the week before was about those dark uh spaces with these light areas coming out of them as we look at rococo we're going to see a, a completely different interpretation of that light and and uh, how it's reflected uh, in the paintings the term rococo was coined by combining uh rocaille uh, meaning pebble pebble and barocco meaning baroque and if you remember that means broken or uh but to negatively refer to the taste fashionable under uh louis the ninth uh, Rococo was a reaction against the Baroque style. Rococo and Baroque had complete uh, complexity of forms, but Rococo replaced those dark colors, those heavy decoration with pinks, light blues, light greens, white. We're going to see lots of pastel colors uh, versus that sort of dark rich. We had lots of deep reds and dark blues and that sort of thing. We're going to see a, a, a drastic change. After completing this lesson, we're going to be able to address how Rococo artists rejected those Baroque ideals and stylistic characteristics through playfulness, color, and grace. Remember the seriousness of some of those paintings of Baroque. We're going to be looking at some just uh, some nonsensical stuff sometimes in, in the uh, Rococo. Recognize the light color palette and subject matter that is characterized by Rococo art. Again, looking for how that light is changed. Uh, classify artworks within their culture uh, through materials, style, and content. So again, if we look here at this uh, and uh, Antoine uh, Watu, I'm terrible with the uh, pronunciation, particularly in the French, is a credit with uh, creating a genre of Rococo painting known as Fete Galant, in which outdoor merriment and nobility are depicted. Uh, and so if you look very very different use of color we don't if, if this was uh, that typical baroque painting it would be almost black in the background we wouldn't have these really light blues the softest the placements in the piece with the gentle shimmering colors and feathery brushworks typify that rococo period um again even uh, the clothing uh, that really pastel blue green is not a color we would have seen likely um, dominant in the Baroque we saw before. When we look at the subject matter and how it changed drastically, again, we're kind of looking at the frivolous, uh, the unnecessary. Um, this is the French Rococo painter Jean Honor Fragon, Fragonard, uh, 1732 to 1806. This exemplified the Rococo style, uh, characterized by the delicate hedonism uh, of the swing. And then we're going to look at how this style is primarily uh, based on Rubens. You know, when we look at Rubens, had that three-dimensionality and that, that use of that um, chiaroscuro. Well, uh, we see that dark um, being replaced with more light. And so uh, it really kind of affects how that chiaroscuro idea of the things kind of emitting out of that dark space into the light uh, is very different. Uh, this has a rapid... Uh, vigorous, fluent composition. Uh, these aren't light. Uh, or these are light. Um, uh, not tight and fussy. Uh, if you think about the space around, uh, we're seeing lots of open space as, as the, the figure is surrounded by the trees and the lightness of that space kind of coming in from the left. Again, if we compare this to what we would have seen in a Baroque, in a, uh, Baroque painting, that space would have been very dark behind. It would have almost uh, encapsulated. It would have surrounded the darkness of that uh, space, would have surrounded that central figure. And so these are not tight. These are more loose, open um, uh, compositions. Fragonard's erotically intriguing piece, The Swing, was originally commissioned from a serious history painter, uh, by an unknown French nobleman who said, I desire that you should paint Madame pointing to his mistress, on a swing which is being set in motion by a bishop. 
You must place me where I can have a good view of the legs and of the pretty of this pretty little thing. This portrays that frivolous nature of Rococo's subject matter and uh, contrasts it to that Baroque period. Again, uh, subject matter alone. We would not have seen the subject matters we saw in, uh, um, at the end of that Baroque period were we looked at were very historical in nature, um, often uh, sort of documentary um, uh, in the way that they captured things. These are just frivolous paintings of everyday life. Uh, the purest exponent of Italian uh, Rococo uh, was Gian Battista's uh, Tipolo, uh, the last of the great Venetian decorators. Uh, Tipolo's the apotheosis of the Pisani family uh, is emblematic of the artist's style that's characterized by lightness clarity of color and that technical skill and again if we look at this uh, the ceiling painting much like we saw in those spaces in uh, rococo where you could look up at the ceiling and it looked like the ceiling went up or the space above the ceiling went up indefinitely same sort of thing here but again we're seeing a, uh, a lighter more pastel uh, palette the artists are using uh, this ceiling fresco is conceived as a trump loy and again a trump loy we're thinking is that uh, creation of a three-dimensional space uh, on a two-dimensional surface, uh, opening into a silvery blue sky whose endless depths are de defined by various towering cloud formations. And those cloud formations are very often, uh, we, we think if we, if we do inner city paintings, we can show depth by showing uh, the buildings going off into space and getting smaller as they go back into space. Uh, using cloud formations is sort of the technical equivalent of that during uh, during this time the composition consists of two sections that exist independently of one another but the betrayal of the pisani family and the various allegorical figures in the lower portion and the continents in the upper portion the figure of fame surrounding her trumpets in either direction connects the two below her divine wisdom is enthroned and the reigns over the harmonious empire the virtues faith justice love hope and strength appear at her feet Shown here are the, not, the known continents of Asia, America, and Africa on a cloud with Europe, Europe above on a bull to exhibit the greater degree of civilization Europe possessed. A, a battle scene along the lower edge and picture refers to the subjugation of the Turks. Members of the Pisani family are surrounded by several allegorical figures. Uh, the truth, truth appears as a naked woman. The crowned woman atop the globe and seen from behind personifies Italy while the various arts of the rep are represented at her feet. Astronomy with telescope and a globe, music is with a horn and a score, sculpture is depicted with block and marble and bust, as well as painting with a brush. The allegories of peace with the palm leaves and the plenty with the amphora and floral crown complete the scene on the left-hand side. So symbolism is huge. Representation of these different allegorical figures um, is something we're going to see uh, repeated throughout uh, that um, Rococo period. The softness and delicacy of characterized by Rococo are evident in architecture as well. And remember in the Baroque architecture, uh, we talked about how uh, sculpture, ornamentation, lots of different areas, alcoves and sections that had many, many, many stories. If it looked like there was a whole lot going on, it's probably Baroque. Well, Rococo takes that and tweaks it just a little bit, kind of turns up the orn ornamentation, if you will. Um, this is a John Balthar, Bal Balthazar, excuse me, Newman, uh, also a military general who built this, the Kaiserall, Kaiserall, excuse me, in Würzburg, German. I'm assuming that's Germany. Uh, the complete merger of the painting executed by Topolo, a sculpture and architecture in mature Rococo fashion is evident through multiple rhythmic shapes and contours throughout the work. And when they talk about this rhythm, uh, rhythmical contours, we're looking at those arches. Again, that's a reflection of that Greek and Roman architecture, um, the ornamentation added by the Baroque period, and then continued even further now into this Rococo period. We're looking again at how that architecture is evolving and developing and progressing and maturing and almost getting a little crazy with how ornament uh, uh, ornamental is becoming. Delicate curving stucco uh, tendrils and sprays of foliage create the air of lively nature. And nature is going to play a big part, um, particularly as we look at the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, coming ahead, you're going to see the influences of nature 
um, playing heavily. The liveliness, sensuality, and intimacy of Rokuk are also evident in the smallish and more delicate sculptures of the period. So one of the things to recognize here is when we talk about smallish sculptures up to now, throughout the Italian Renaissance, the um, Baroque period, sculpture has been life size or larger for the, for the most part. Uh, most of the sculpture we have uh, it depicted is on a very grand scale, if you will. Rococo brings with it uh, not necessarily one called miniaturization, but the idea that uh, the sculpture didn't have to be huge, uh, even if it's going to be seen in the round. Um, and again, that means from 360 walking around. Um, but what's interesting about Rococo, and, and again, if we consider that idea that as things progress from the Renaissance through Baroque, through Rococo, ornamentation and that um, delicacy, if you will, becoming more and more... Um, important in the works of art we can see that delicacy very much on display in this work of art <clears throat> if we look at the sculpture all of the little um accent pieces are very detailed and if you consider the the um the detail level combined with the reduced scale in other words they're creating more detail on a smaller scale it's 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 really reflective of the artistic um, uh, mastery that had to uh, be achieved to get that level of delicacy on that small scale. Uh, the works of Claude Michel called Clodium uh, was influenced by Bernini as seen in the open, vivid, dynamic, satire crowning uh, Bachant. I'm butchering the name of that one. This piece excludes sexuality and is generally more intricate and delicate. Standing not quite two feet tall um, and more uh, delicate than uh, Bernini sculptures. And again, um, that scale plays a little bit in that, but it's also, again, very reflective of the, the, the mastery and the understanding of, um, of that media. So next we're going to be looking at the Age of Enlightenment. You are going to have um, an assignment for Rococo. You um, are going to take a quiz. It's a short quiz. I don't think... Um, I believe it's like a 10 question. Maybe it's 20. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we're going to look at, that's the only assignment you're going to have this week is that uh, is that assessment that they're at, at the end of Rococo. We're looking at the Age of Enlightenment uh, with the rest of the class today. And the Age of Enlightenment is really 18th century, uh, 1700s. But um, what we're going to look at is it goes, kind of bleeds into the, uh, the, um, the 19th century a little bit, and we're going to see that influence of naturalism and, and, and naturalistic, uh, or I should say the influence of nature, not just naturalistic, but, uh, the nature itself. The enlightenment in the 18th century was an extraordinary experience of knowledge rooted in the scientific and intellectual, intellectual developments of the 17th century. Natural law, universal order, human reason influenced all 18th century society and art. After completing this lesson, we're going to be able to connect the dominant themes of natural law, universal order, human reason to find uh, the Age of Enlightenment. Also recognize how new scientific exploration and the Industrial Revolution defined the art of the period and broke from Okoko's frivolous subject matter. <clears throat> and again, uh, when we think about frivolous, if it didn't look important, there you go, Rococo. Wright, Darby, and Pritchard. Uh, Wright, this is Enlightenment scientific exploration is evident in Joseph Wright of Derby's uh, a philosopher lecturing on orary. Uh, this shows uh, learned and ordinary people marveling at a planetary model whose bands represent the orbits of the planets. The light in the piece comes from a lamp that serves as the sun model and illuminates the faces of the listeners. And again, if we look at this piece, uh, first of all, stylistically, it goes back, harkens back to that uh, Baroque period with that dark, uh, these, these figures sort of kind of come out, uh, and, and, and into this space through the light. That's that, um, chiaroscuro type of, uh, use of the light there. When we look though at the symbolism that's played, uh, out, you know, we looked at how allegory was on display through Rococo, how we saw, um, religious uh, symbolism throughout Baroque and even in the early Renaissance. Uh, here we see symbolism, reflecting not religion, but science. Um, Darby and Pritchard, the Industrial Revolution, impacted the world with art and an introduction of iron and steel as an artistic medium. Remember that it was the uh, Romans who brought us um, uh, 
concrete and concrete was this uh, incredible architectural development that allowed arches and domes and all kinds of fantastic fantastic things well the use of iron and steel as an artistic medium in a building uh, and an architectural construction medium uh, was enormous uh, as enormous and big a change as concrete was the iron bridge at colebrook dale in england uh, prefigured the widespread skeletal use of iron and steel in 19th century and you'll see uh, while this bridge is a thousand years old, it looks a lot like the bridges we've got today. The first iron bridge in history was conceived by Abraham Darby III, owner of a significant iron um, cast, a cast iron business, and architect Thomas F. Pritchard, whose design is similar to the aqueducts of ancient Rome. So again, we're seeing that Roman influence. Uh, if this was all done out of concrete, it would look very much like one of those Roman aqueducts. There we go. Natural art of France and Italy. One of the most, uh, the great debates during the second half of the 18th century was between Voltaire and Jean Jacques Rousseau. Voltaire believed that the answer to society's ills were the progression of society and reason. So, in becoming more learned and more educated, uh, was going how we were going to um, progress, and that would f fix society. Rousseau believed that society actually corrupted mankind. And the only solution was to rediscover nature and to, to have a, you know, a, a back to nature, if you will. Rousseau's philosophy had a tremendous impact on the art of the period, as artists and patrons alike abandoned the artifice of Rococo in search for the natural. So, um, if you think about the frivolous of Rococo as viewers of art went, it really just kind of highlight, highlighted the... Um, how society was broken into classes and and how there there wasn't really a a shared understanding but yet nature is one of those things that kind of brings everybody as a general understanding we all can kind of appreciate and understand uh, nature if you will and so uh, it was sort of this this harkening back to this that we see a complete shift in uh the use again of light and and if we look at how uh these spaces and depths are uh, compared this is a, you know, looking out into this ocean space. Imagine those, comparing this to those open vaulted ceilings where we had the clouds creating that depth, that space uh, going up, if you will. Um, the 18th century naturalism, uh, naturalness, excuse me, came in a variety of forms. And Vudetta uh, paintings were um, some of the most popular. One of the most acclaimed of the Vudettist was the Venetian Antonio Calanetto whose works were characterized by the detailed mastery of light and shadow. St. Mark Canaletto started to dilate, uh, dilate space, excuse me, uh, uh, dilate space as if he were viewing it through a wild, a wide angle lens. The panoramic effect was achieved by lowering the line of the horizon. Over half the canvas is occupied by the sky to increase the solemn portrayal. So it, it, again, by bringing that eye level down, that horizon line down, and giving more space uh, to the uh, sky and, and, and so forth, he's created in kind of this, this panoramic effect. Now, we, we are more commonly associated and familiar with panoramic um, photography as every camera now that you carry around, every phone will create a panoramic um, scene. Panoramic painting was new for painters, and this is, you know, the idea that, uh, again, if you think about the restricted paintings of Baroque, where the subject was this one small idea or figure or uh, element being surrounded by this darkness, um, we saw how that progressed to where um, the Rococo opened that up, the lightness, and we saw more of those free uh, and open compositions. Well, now we got panoramic. We can't get any more free. We are uh, as open in that space as you can kind of get. The naturalness was um, peasant of, of was peasantry, who's Rousseau, uh, who Rousseau considered close to nature and less corrupt by society. Uh, sort of the poorer you were, the more likely you were to be connected with with nature. Jean Baptiste Gruz was a painter who of sentimental narratives. The village bride is a scene in a modest country home, uh, which a father passes his daughter dowry to the future son-in-law before a notary on the lower right. 
<laughs> That's a lovely way to give your daughter away, isn't it? The scene is filled with sincerity and gentility. Uh, the father graciously blesses the couple who tenderly take each other's arms. Meanwhile, the bride-to-be is caressed by her loving mother and embraced by her sister. Come on. Did I go too far? No, I didn't. Sorry. My apologies. In this uh, Chardin, uh, in these works by Chardin, narrative paintings uh, with moral themes continued in popularity in the latter half of the 18th century. Uh, a continued reaction to that frivolous uh, and, and risque Rococo. Again, we're looking at how the um, these um, artists in the Age of Enlightenment we're wanting to really take a look at what really goes on in people's lives. How what what are simple, honest people doing? And and again, thinking about how those the the people who are most uh, in tune with nature are probably going to be those who are the most simple in society that are just li living those daily lives like normal people. Simple, quiet, domestic scene. Uh, in this case, a mother and her daughter prepare for a meal in the atmosphere of light, uh, uh, soft lighting, and gentle muted colors. We don't see that bright, uh, excessive use of pastels, pinks, and blues, and greens. Sort of a return to that um, that soft, naturalistic color that we saw towards the end of the um, Baroque period. Um, and again, sort of a reflection of that darkness from the from the Baroque period. Um, and, and, and as a uh, sort of a... Um, uh, re uh, rebel against that uh, that pastel-y, lighty ro ro Rococo art. Uh, the na naturalistic trend was also evident in, in portraiture as seen in the self-portrait by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Lebrun. Boy, I got that one right, I think. <laughs> the artist interrupts her work to actively engage the viewer. Uh, the expression and dress are completely natural. <laughs> One of the most technically fluent and popular artists of her era, her works are notable for their freshness, charm, and sensitivity. Lebrun claimed to have painted 877 pictures, including 622 portraits and 200 or so landscapes. Most famous are the portraits of Marie Antoinette, uh, King of, uh, I mean, wife of King Louis, who we all learned to love so much uh, last week. Uh, and this painting, I love this. This is the natural art in Britain and the United States. In England, the trends towards moralistic themes had a uh, satirical bent. Uh, William Horgarth's uh, series of paintings read like chapters in the book, each displaying a particular societal ill. And I, when we talk about symbolism, allegory, uh, allegory used in paintings, this is rich. In Marriage of La Mode, uh, a la, Marriage a la Mode, a viewer follows the unhappy marriage between the daughter of a rich, miserable merchant who wishes uh, to advance socially, and the son of an impoverished but still arrogant earl who desperately needs the merchant's money. Breakfast scene is second is the second in a series of six. Many clues of the wretched state of the young couple marriage are visually depicted. And so, if we look at the scene on the right, you know, we don't really, you know, recognize as viewers uh, in this day and era all of the uh, the symbolism. But through its, though it's past noon, the couple's still wearing the clothes from the night before, which means they're clearly exhausted. They've been staying up all night. Um... The wife apparently had a rowdy music and card party. This is evident the instrument music's tossed an overturned chair, the loose deck of cards on the ground, and the exasperated servant cleaning up after the mess. We look at the husband. Uh, he obviously spent his night elsewhere. Note how he still is wearing the hat and overcoat while his sword and belt have clearly just been removed. Uh, like his wife, the character of the husband is also questionable. The black spot on his neck indicates that the young man is taking um, mercurial pills, which were the only known treatment for venereal disease at the time. The family dog sniffs the lady's cap in his pocket, which he doesn't believe is his wife, just based on how the dog's reacting. To the left, the steward carrying a stick of unpaid, uh, stack of unpaid bills leaves the room uh, with his hands raised in, a in despair at all the disorder. And I loved how... Uh, the viewer is supposed to know those are unpaid bills. Uh, in the far room, the combination of religious paintings, portrayals of saints, with the work so erotic that it must be covered with a curtain, this illustrates the hypocrisy of the union of the uh, of the marriage here. The painting over the mantelpiece shows Cupid 
uh, among ruins uh, while the bust in front of the broke has a broken nose symbolizing impotence. Hogarth portrayed a biting satirical comment in the immorality of wealthy classes who engage in marriage for, so for social and monetary gain rather than that love and companionship. Um, and then we're looking, uh, these are the works of Gainsborough and West, um, Thomas Gainsborough. Uh, and if you look at the date, 1727, 1788, where he's painting roughly in the 1740s, 1780s, the, the mid to late half of the 1700s. And um, same with uh, West. We're looking at the introduction in the 1800s. And that's important because uh, I want to take just a moment here and also kind of compare what was going on uh, in the United States uh, at, at this roughly same time. Um, <laughs> when we look at the works of Gainsborough, the softness of the color is feathery brushworks of Rococo. Uh, despite those influences, Gainsborough works identified by their natural elements. Uh, the artist portrayal of Mrs. Uh, Mary. Perdita Robinson, Gainsborough has blended the natural beauty of the landscape and the natural beauty of a sitter. Uh, this is a sincere, honest, and genteel portrait, unlike the, ha the haughty portraits of the Baroque and frivolous compositions of Rococo. Uh, West was an American artist, interpreted the natural and heroic scenes, the depth of the General Wolf by Benjamin West. Uh, the young and morally wounded uh, General Wolfe is portrayed just after leading the British to victory over the French at the Battle of Quebec, which gave Canada to the English crown. And um, as we look, as we finish up this, I kind of want, want just real quickly to take a look. These are works of what we call the Hudson River School of Art. Uh, we're talking 1800s um, in the United States. So uh, really just right after. Uh, but you can sort of see the reflection, the influences of that uh, early enlightenment period uh that i mean the age of enlightenment period if we look at at uh that depth the use of light um creating these big scenes again that reflective of nature uh clearly what was going on at the time uh in um in france and uh in, in europe was uh, obviously spreading around the world and, and influencing art um uh, every corner of the globe uh, the moral themes within narrative paintings dominated with na the rational period of the Enlightenment during the 18th century. This reaction, uh, the frivolous Rococo is seen in the naturalism and uh, genre scenes and portraits. Uh, you will complete the reading activities for the lesson, review the notes, blah, blah, blah. No assessment for the Age of Enlightenment, but don't forget you do have that Rococo uh, quiz to take. Thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you next week.